Um, all right, welcome back, everybody. We are pleased to have with us Dr. Marina Money uh, from Utah Psychological Services. Uh, again, I want to thank her for coming. I uh, had a last minute cancellation, and so we really, really appreciate her for coming and filling in. Uh, just a reminder, with questions, she told me on the break that she would love questions. We've got a handful here, but uh, remember, my cell phone is 801-921-3274. So please text me with those questions or if you want to email me. Um, I, I'm sort of checking my email, but my text is a better way. Uh, Marina said that she's got a slide that's going to introduce herself, so I will just turn the time over to her. Hello. Thank you so much for being here and listening to me. I appreciate it. So a little bit about who I am, just quickly. I'm a psychologist. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist, and I have been working with the juvenile justice system, and Tyson was just reminding me it was youth corrections. <laughs> we go way back. Uh, for about 23 years, I've been working with them, and I've been a court-appointed psychologist for the 4th District Juvenile Court for 12 years with a few tiny little breaks in there. And in this role of working with both uh, the juvenile court and JJS as well as DCFS, uh, I've written over 2,000 evaluations and I've supervised over 2,000 more. So evaluation and working with juveniles is what I really enjoy doing. <laughs> and I've also, um, I serve as a NOJOS board member. If you're not familiar with NOJOS, it's the Network on Juveniles Offending Sexually, and we'll talk about that in this presentation. I've co-authored the NOJOS Assessment Standards, and I've also served as an expert witness in both juvenile and district court. So, been around, done this for a while. Hopefully what I have to tell you today will be helpful. Um, so NOJOS, as I said, it's the Network on Juveniles Offending Sexually, and they have a great website, nojos.net, with some good resources. They, their focus is on a holistic intervention of sexual abuse uh, to enhance the professional field of knowledge and to develop and sustain the quality of the statewide continuum of services and care. So that's their mission statement. Basically, we're a group of uh, both providers like therapists and psychologists, as well as residential treatment programs, line staff, probation, juvenile probation officers. We even uh, have some attorneys come in once in a while and we work together for the betterment of uh, treating and working with juveniles who sexually offend. I know one of the questions uh, that I put on your handout is what are the levels and what do they mean and why, you know, so I want to talk a little bit about the levels. So I apologize, this slide is a little blurry because I cut and pasted it, uh, but in your, in your handout it does list those eight levels. So we're going to start at the bottom and if you see in this triangle in the slide, uh, the bottom is the least restrictive and these are the youth with the lighter weight offenses or misbehavior, right? And the very top of the triangle is the most restrictive, and these are the youth with the more serious offenses. So we actually start at level one on the bottom. And this is your in-home treatment uh, where the youth remains in their family home, unless their victim is in their home, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and we do outpatient, and it's mostly mostly psychosexual education. So we're not really doing a ton of victim work. These are more for the kids who who do the things like frottage and foyerism and exhibitionism. In other words, the gropers and the flashers and the peepers and the you know those kinds of things, or who have very 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 minimal minimal contact, grabbing girls' butts at school. Um, you know, maybe did it one time, you know, touched over the clothing with a cousin or something like that. So very minimal. We're mostly helping them understand how that harms other people. And we go into level two, the, the youth usually remains in the home, but we're gonna do a more, of a, um, more of intensive outpatient treatment. So they're often in individual therapy as well as group. Not always, but that's typically how it is. And it's for a longer period of time and we're doing focus on the victim. In these cases on a level two, they have acted out with a victim. Uh, level three uh, could be one of two things. Oh, you know what, let me see if I made slides. Oh, I did. You know what? We're going to go on with the slideshow because you don't have to 
you don't have to look that blurry slide. So uh, we have eight levels. So level one, uh, we went over this already. It's like lewdness, sexting without a threat, a single incident that's not very invasive. Oh, and our other level one is our Romeo and Juliet. So we have, um, you know, youth who are choosing and boyfriend, girlfriend to have sex, but it's very inappropriate due to a young age. So a no just level one is a psychose uh, psychosexual, psychosexual education, as I said, in home, usually eight to 12 weeks. Uh, not, it's not very confrontational, it's more educational. Um, so we move into level two. These are our first time offenders. They might have offended one time or they might have offended 29 times. So they might have offended over a period of a week or over a period of two years. Uh, there's a varied level of invasiveness. What we're really going to look at are the protective factors and the amount of family support as to whether we can sustain them in their family home while they get treatment. And again, I'm going to let you know uh, if the victim is in the home, that does take things in a different direction. And we'll talk about that later. And so the, um, the t treatment for that is they're either in their home or in a kinship home, about six to 10 months, they get individual therapy, group therapy, family therapy. They do victim work as well as get the psychosexual education. Level three is a family-based intervention. Um, and there's two types of level three. I think I have a slide for the other type. So one is where they come into the home. If you're in Salt Lake County, you may be familiar with Utah Youth Village. They have a program that does this, where they spend a lot of treatment in the home. So what we're looking at is the youth needs greater frequency, longer duration. They have more victims. Uh, and there's some family risk factors that need to be addressed and maybe a lack of support from the family. Um, and so it's in home, but the, in, the therapy comes into the home and works with these youth. It's about 60 to 90 days plus a transition, and it includes group therapy, individual therapy, family therapy, and family support. We also have no just level three day treatment. So it's the same level, just a different way of doing the treatment. And so this is where, as you can see in the picture, Mr. Hansey probably shouldn't be in a public school if he's going around with the ladies and doing this. So he needs a more contained environment. So these are for youth that are moderate risk. Uh, we need to mind the community safety. So maybe the parents can contain, contain the child at night in the home, but we don't want to put this child in the public school system or have this child wandering around the community during the daytime. We want them contained and treated, and then the parent could provide the supervision at night. Um, and so oftentimes they'll remain in home or possibly at the kinship or even foster placement, and they get a lot of supervision and structure, supervised schooling so they aren't in the schools acting out. Uh, it's a very therapeutic day treatment milieu. Um, individual family group therapy. Okay, level four. Level four is when we have a significant concern with the family home. And so the youth has acted out, He's at, he or she is at moderate risk, but the family factors are not gonna be supportive of this youth making the changes the youth needs to make and containing the youth and keeping the youth safe to the community. Um, so there's usually a lack of supervision and a lack of structure in that family home. And so we're going to put the child in foster or proctor care care as well as do outpatient treatment. And so again, we're going to have that individual family group uh, very similar to a level two, except for the child is now in state's custody in an official proctor or foster home with a case manager or a, a case uh, worker. So then we move on to no just level five. These are our moderate high risk youth. These are the ones that have acted out either numerous times with numerous victims or extremely intensely with one or two or a few victims or all of the above. Um, and so we also want to assess that there, we want to look at the family risk factors, why this, if this you should be removed from the home. Again, we're concerned about lack of structure, lack of supervision, but we're also maybe seeing some behavioral problems in the youth, you know, some oppositionalism, some other uh, criminal type behaviors, lack of willingness to comply. So maybe we've tried them down a different road. They're just sitting there with, you know, flying that flag of their middle finger and they're not going to do it. So we, we go ahead and put them in a group home. 
setting. And so this is a placement um, in a group home where they're in state's custody, either DCFS or JJS, and they have a very high level of uh, supervision and structure. In fact, rarely are they in the community without a line staff or another designated supervisor with them. So it's, it's, it's a, a fairly safe setting for, for their containment. And then in this program, they would be receiving all those therapeutic services that I keep mentioning, individual therapy, group therapy, family therapy. Um, and they're at a therapeutic daily milieu also. And so um, there's also a little side branch of a level five and that's independent living. And so this is could be a step down from a group home or a residential treatment center, secure care. Um, we know that at that point, if they were in secure care or a residential treatment center, they completed their programming there. So it's more of a step down. So they could be in the community uh, with on and off supervision, you know, check in, you know, things like that. Um, and the focus is on helping that youth become independent. So this program is appropriate for our older youth, those that are 17, 18. Sometimes we even have 19 year olds still in custody because they took that long to do their treatment, you know, and so they, they still need that supervision to transition them back fully into the community. Um, and so we kind of talked about this. They're going to get mentoring and all the treatment. It's a step down program. We're going to focus on helping them become adults, get them job skills, get them into higher education, whatever it might be, which also, by the way, are protective factors. So the more we have these kids in the community with near same age peers working, going to college or a trade tech school or whatever it might be, the more protection we have against them offending again. So it's a win win. Okay, level six. These are moderate high to high risk kids. Um, so they, as I said, have had lots of offenses or some really significant, highly invasive offenses. Um, typically, they have several victims, several offenses is the typical profile. Uh, the, the family has a lot of risk factors or that the kid is just so high risk, even if the family's great, we're still want, wanting to put them in that highly structured setting. So we see, you know, oftentimes these kids don't have the supervision they need or the structure they need. They have some specific behavioral problems, but they also have mental health problems oftentimes. Um, and so we're gonna put them in a residential treatment center that's sex offense specific. And so again, they'll get a lot of those things, but the focus will be more so on the therapy rather than the independent living or kind of learning to live in the community because a lot of times these kids have unmet therapeutic needs. We have a high level, uh, or not a high level, but we have many kids who might have issues like autism or lower intellectual functioning or si some significant mental health issues that need this kind of treatment. Um, now, level seven, we currently don't have a level seven in Utah. We used to about six years ago. Um, these are for kids who really need that psychiatric component. And so the way we're addressing this now is these youth will typically go into a level six, but they will also get psychiatric services. So they might need to be medicated and receive more specific uh, mental health treatment due to um, severe mental illness. And so I'm not really gonna go through this slide very much. Basically, we're just gonna add those extra treatment components. Okay, level eight. This is the highest level of no just treatment. This is secure care. This is, um, you know, our similar to our Slate Canyons and our Wasatch and, and all those Mill Creek and all that, only they're specific units for youth who have sexually acted out. And so um, these youth have, engaged in really uh, coercive or forced, highly invasive sexual offenses. Um, and oftentimes it's a repeat offense. So they've done it to multiple victims or one victim multiple times. And so these, um, these are the youth that we just know are unsafe to be in the community and likely unsafe to be in a residential treatment center because they may act out with force or harm to others or simply that their offense or offenses were so harmful to the victims that a secure care is the level 
that we see necessary kind of you know where they need to be in our community at this point um yes um how many level eight facilities excuse me do you have in utah and what's the current population because i have never heard of a level eight recommendation yet really we have trouble hearing the questions here. Like oh, okay. So he was wondering how many facilities we have that are level eight and what's the current number. And I'm going to tell you, I'm a little outdated because they just um, closed Wasatch and they moved it all to Decker Lake. So I know Decker Lake is in Salt Lake County um, and they have the sex offense specific unit out there. I am not aware. They did have one at Farmington Bay. I am not aware if Farmington Bay is still open to sex offense specific youth. So there's one or two that I know, and I'm certainly happy to be corrected by anyone who has more up-to-date knowledge. Uh, they've done some rearranging in the last year, so I haven't quite kept up. I don't know how many youth are placed in level eight. I know personally in my 22 years of making recommendations in fourth district, as well as um, sixth and eighth district and some sometimes uh, first district, uh, I have probably made, I want to say less than 10 recommendations in 20 years. I've never heard of yeah. Yet. Yeah. Um, it, it's there. Oftentimes, we want to give that youth a, a chance in a lower level. And so sometimes what level eight ends up being is the, if you see on the slide, the end of the line. So we try them out in something at a lower level and the kid attacks somebody or, you know, they're, they're going as a group to the grocery store and the kid is offending on somebody, you know, with the group, with supervision, you know, or the kid is just digging in his heels and refusing to cooperate in treatment. So sometimes it's the end of the line treatment. It's like, hey, if we can't help you at this lower level, be my guest. Here you go. Say hello to this, you know, eight by eight cell with a, a window in the door so everybody can see you go to the bathroom. Yeah, have fun with that, you know. And that does tend to help youth realize that, you know, there is a higher power and it's helpful for them to be accountable and make some changes. Um, so we're really looking at putting youth there who are violent or who are who have committed some really significant sexual offenses, or as I said, end of the line. I wish I had more statistics for you. So Okay. <laughs> and then um, once they go into level eight, they're in the care of the youth parole authority. So they're no longer under the jurisdiction of a judge. Um, so the youth parole authority determines their sentence. And so they're in what is primarily a secure care environment and it's enhanced by the staff and a therapist doing the sex offense specific treatment. So that's how that works. So they do group and individual. Family is very limited because as I pointed out, the two facilities that I'm aware of are in Salt Lake County and in Farmington, if that one still is there. So, you know, when you have youth whose families live in St. George or something like that, it's gonna be telephonic or teletherapy. Um, and unfortunately, the youth I've worked with in these facilities oftentimes don't have very supportive family anyway that's willing to engage. Um, the problem with secure care is it's not an opportunity for skilled practice. As you can imagine, th these are not co-ed units. They're gender specific. And so we have just a bunch of males. Um, they have very limited contact outside of the facility. And so often after a no-jose level eight, we're going to want to place that child in a step down facility so so they could practice what they've learned. We don't want to just assume that they, if they saw it in a, in a slide presentation or heard about it in therapy that they're going to know how to do it when it comes to real life. So often after level eight, we do a step down. And so those are the eight levels of no-jos. And the biggest deal is uh, matching the youth to the correct level of treatment. And as you know, I love doing evaluations, so it's through assessment. Um, sometimes judges can just choose a level. Sometimes probation officers can just recommend a level. 
and that happens and that's fine because a lot of our the juvenile probation officers that I work with are fabulous they're really wise they really are experienced they know what they're doing I trust their judgment but a lot of times we want to get assessment because it allows for the best um, treatment practice an evaluator like myself will really understand you know what that specific youth needs and why that specific youth might be different than the, uh, the next youth in line. Um, it helps to ensure community safety because my name's going on that eval. I take it very seriously that I'm not putting a youth back in the community that could hurt another child. That's, that's my personal responsibility that I'm very concerned about. So we want community safety. Um, this is my favorite slide because I cannot tell you how much getting an assessment up front will save time, money, and frustration at the end of the line. I'm going to quickly tell the story that I often tell about how I evaluated a young woman who was in sex-specific treatment. And she was in a group home and had been there for a year and a half, 18 months. And it's like 3500 a month. So that's quite a bit of money that the state's been paying. And they never had her properly assessed to start with. And they were frustrated with her because she wasn't getting anywhere in treatment. And they thought she was oppositional. And they thought she was digging in her heels and just being you know, defiant. Well, the first thing I did was give her an IQ test. And she was low functioning. She was intellectually disabled. And so when they were telling me she's not doing her worksheets, I'm like, well, it's probably because she doesn't read them and can't understand them. And when she's not completing her assignments, it's because she doesn't understand the concepts. So I felt very badly that this young woman had a year and a half in her life in a program that, that wasn't helpful to her because she didn't have the ability to have it be helpful to her. So that was a lot of state tax dollars, a lot of time on the part of the treatment team being, you know, and a lot of frustration on everyone's part. Um, to be ethical, we want to make sure we have the youth in, youth in the right level of treatment because that's ethical. <laughs> we want to give people what they need for treatment. Okay, so the forensic psychologist. <laughs> um, our goal is to determine the treatment and placement needs of the offending juvenile through psychological testing and psychological assessment. And then we turn around and write it in a report and, and give that report to the judge. And there are um, master's level therapists who also do sexual behavioral risk assessments. So um, I recommend either a psychosexual, which is a psychological evaluation with a sexual behavioral risk assessment, or at least a sexual behavioral risk assessment to help determine the youth's needs, especially if they're a tricky youth, especially if you get this feeling like there's something more going on. You definitely want an assessment. You have a question. Yeah, sometimes I think that we do need a psychosexual NRA request, and we get some pushback from probation, where they want to see someone who is Okay, so her question was, was she's made a recommendation for a psychosexual and then there's some pushback saying, now I'm not quite understanding, they're saying they want what before they... We need to be able to point to some reason why an SBRA itself isn't sufficient. And sometimes it is just this oh. something else. Yes, okay, so, so sometimes an SBRA is approved because a psychosexual costs more and we want to be aware of the taxpayer's dollars. We do, I pay taxes. And so, you know, it's that much more money to do a full psychosexual. And here's what I'd recommend you say is you get in tune with yourself, right? Gavin DeBecker's book, The Gift of Fear, right? You have intuition. Get in tune with yourself. What are you noticing about this juvenile? Do they seem to just be slower functioning? Do they seem to be really resistant and defiant? Do they seem to perhaps have some more significant mental health problem like a bipolar disorder or even severe ADHD can be problematic. My favorite one that goes undetected a lot is do they seem a little bit like they might have Asperger's, which is what we used to call it. Now we call it high functioning autism. You know, are they rigid? Do they have difficulty with moving from one task to the other? Do they have these repetitive behaviors? Do they have lack of social skills and eye contact? I am finding that um, I do a lot of evaluations where the youth has very high functioning autism so nobody's really catching it. He's just the goofy looking kid, but nobody really gets why. And then when I do testing, I'm like, uh, this kid has autism. We need to be aware of that. So, and a lot of times in sex offense, um, youth with autism tend to have this 
hyper focus and if it turns sexual you know like we always talk about kids with autism like trains have you ever heard that or legos trains and legos they seem to really have this interest in trains or legos well when we get an autistic kid who has a hyper focus with pornography <laughs> that becomes a problem because then they want to try it out you know on real people which tend to be children because children don't really say no that much peers say get away from me you're weird children don't know how to say no right and so I'm, I'm kind of digressing is this helpful get in tune with what you think it might be and then make your request very specific to I am wondering if this youth has some depression that might interfere or I am wondering if this youth might be high functioning autism or something it doesn't mean you have to be right I mean, you're not the evaluator. You know? That's my job. But it really helps for me to have a referral question to say, we're wondering if this youth's level of defiance is going to interfere with his treatment on a level two. Because that's very real. <laughs> did I answer your question? You did. Okay. <laughs> All right. So one of the biggest purposes of the evaluation is to determine the risk of recidivism. Is it likely if this youth is going to act out again? Now, that's almost an impossible question to answer, but we try our best to kind of say, here's how we're going to do it. He needs this treatment or this containment or something like that. Okay. Uh, determine the population at risk. Has this youth only acted out with young children? Are they fine to still go to junior high? They're not going to be acting out on their peers. Or is this youth only acting out on peers and they've never once acted out on young children? You know, we want to look at what we're watching for. And I should say, though, we do have cross offenses. You know, just because a juvenile offends on peers doesn't mean they won't offend on children. That's important to understand and vice versa. But we do like to look at the populations at risk. What are their specific risk factors? You know, do we have, um, like, I'm sorry, I get weird with the pictures. You know, are we letting a, a 14 year old who's, you know, in the middle of fun puberty and sexual exploration change the baby's diaper you know with a, with a group of other boys you know probably not a good idea you know what are the risk factors is there appropriate supervision in the home is there you know other things happening with this youth is this youth exposed to you know to pornography is this youth exposed to maybe um you know, mom has a little revolving door of, of men coming through the house. So he's very overly sexualized. You know, what are the risk factors? Um, and then we have, what are the protective factors? And research is telling us, we just had our NoJo's conference and, and the national speaker there was telling us protective factors really matter. Is this kid on sports teams? Because if he is, let's keep him on those sports teams. Is this kid, you know, in drama or some other school activity? Is this kid a, a church goer and really likes his or her youth group? Is this kid really, you know, have a job and they're, they're respected and appreciated? They're, you know, the top employee. We want these protective factors. Does this kid have a strong family or maybe a special connection with grandpa, you know, or something like that? We really want those protective factors. We don't want to control the risk factors so much that we're getting rid of protective factors. We want to enhance the protective factors, if that makes sense. Okay, and then we need to, to know the mitigating elements. Do we need therapy? Do we need supervision? Do we need lack of, you know, loss of electronics? Do we need uh, line of sight supervision? What are all the things? Group therapy, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then do we determine other risk factors that could impede with treatment? And so this might be mental health issues. I already talked about lower intellectual functioning, autism, severe mental illness. Have, has this child been victimized so they're dealing with their own trauma? And is that going to interfere with them dealing with their perpetration? right um do they have severe substance abuse because that could really interfere with treatment as well as many other things in life um and so some other risk factors or conduct issues are there criminogenic factors you know is this youth also a bully you know or willing to violate the rights of others uh do we see lack of accountability do we see a whole lot of thinking errors i i used i always chuckle you know sarcastically chuckle when the kid says well it's her fault she's the one that was walking around in her underwear and i'm like wait you're 15 and she's five you know um <laughs> you know so we look at the thinking errors the lack of empathy we're finding empathy is really important 
teaching kids how to exhibit empathy, right? And is there treatment refusal? And I talked about that. Sometimes you have a kid in treatment and they're just not gonna do it. And you'd give them an assignment and they come back and they, they forgot, they were too busy. They have better things to do. That's when we might look at a different level of treatment needed for that youth. Okay, are also are there environmental issues? How is the family supportive? Does the family supervise? Is there just a complete lack of support? Is is there inability to access treatment? You know, can mom or dad get the child to and from treatment? Is that gonna happen? And if they live out in a little teeny tiny town or mom's working two jobs and she's a single mom, how is that 14 year old gonna get to treatment? You know, um, placement with the victim. We'll talk about that later. I have very strong opinions about that. Um, okay, factors uh, considered when matching youth's needs to treatment format. Okay, so first of all, we want to look at the least restrictive environment balanced with community safety. I always do my little scales, right? We, we don't want any more victims. That's not okay. We also want to remember this is a kid, not an adult. This is a kid who is developing. And I have seen times when the child was so restricted, they would stayed in their home, but they were pretty much locked in their bedroom. And so they find ways, like, did you know you could access pornography on a child's leap frog, leap pad? Yeah, you can. You could get some down and dirty pornography on a child's leap frog, leap pad. You know, that little reading thingy. You can access pornography on Xbox. You could access, and if you think YouTube doesn't have pornography, <laughs> it does lots of it you know so parents say oh he's just looking at YouTube I'm like do you know what's on YouTube so so this child was locked away in his bedroom looking at pornography 24 7 because he wasn't socializing so we took away all the protective factors and even though there were very few risk factors he found the one risk factor that was going to work for him so we want to be very careful that we're balancing right we we want to assess whether that youth can remain in the community. And if that youth can, we want that youth to remain in the community and continue on that developmental trajectory to become a normal adolescent, right? Um, so what we want to look at are number of victims and level of invasiveness. You know, if this youth has had one victim or, or if the level of, you know, it's touching over the clothing, we're going to be less concerned and more likely to keep them in the community, right? Um, we want to look at the risk factors to be mitigated. So we want to look at, is this youth willing to own up? Is this youth willing to say, yeah, I did that. Now, I want to tell you this because this is important to understand. It is normal for kids to lie. It is. So if they're lying, give them a get out of jail pass the first few times. I like to say it has this flower unfolding as they go. So first, Let's just take a typical uh, youth offense situation. Mom walks in and sees 15-year-old Johnny and three-year-old Susie in Johnny's bedroom and Susie has her pants down and Johnny's leaning over her, right? Okay, so mom freaks out. So Johnny is now supposed to tell his mom exactly what he was doing with Susie. How many 15-year-old boys want to tell their mom what they were doing with the three-year-old cousin or sister or whatever, you know? So they're probably not going to tell the truth. Oh, I was just seeing if she needed to change her underwear. You know, they're not going to tell the truth to start with. They might, some do, and that's great. But I'm not worried if they don't. And then, so then it gets reported either by a therapist or by parents or by a community, or like a church leader or something like that. And then so they go to the police station and they get interviewed. Well, now this 15 year old boy is looking at a bunch of police officers and having to tell about his personal sexual history. They're probably not going to tell the truth, but we're hoping they tell more of the truth. Yes, I did pull down Susie's underwear. I did do that, you know, and then they're going to get assigned a probation officer. And now they have to talk to this person they've never met before and tell them about their sexual history. But then we hope they're going to tell more. Yes, and then I did touch Susie on her genitals. And then they're going to go before a judge and, you know, at least have to be somewhat accountable in court, whether they did or did not do something. And then they go see a therapist or an evaluator. You know, in each step, we're hoping the kid is going to tell more and more and more information. If they tell the whole story up front, good for them. They get a gold star. I don't expect every kid to do that, but I do expect them by the time they see me 
after they've had to talk to their parents, had to talk to possibly a therapist or a bishop or something like that, had to talk to the police, had to talk to go before court, work with a probation officer. If they're not, by the time they see me not telling the story, I'm worried. And then that's gonna be their tr primary treatment issue, right? So we want accountability, honesty, and willingness to work. And then we want the parents' willingness to uh, su supervise and support treatment. Because I've had therapists, I mean, I've had parents who have like, Johnny doesn't really need to do this. I don't know why we're here. All boys do this, you know, boys will be boys or whatever the thinking is. And I'm just, okay, you just added three months to your kid's treatment. Good job, mom. Yay. You know, now your kid gets to, you just undid everything I did. That's okay. <laughs> you know. So, all right. Some other things we want to consider are um, that could impede progress. Um, oh, whoops. Are just things that affect safety to others. You know, and we talked about these mental health issues, thinking errors, things like that. Just so you know, these are the typical risk tools that are used. I've just kind of very, I outlined them very briefly for you. So the JSER rat was actually uh, normed here in Utah uh, by our JJS, two of our JJS personnel, along with Doug Epperson over in, I want to say it's Minnesota, but I'm, I'm afraid it might be one of the neighboring states. Um, that one is a risk tool. It's an actuarial tool. So it looks at offense statistics, offense style, victim issues. Um, and I hope I'm answering some of your questions that you gave me on this page with this slide. Um, if they have any, an IEP is an individualized education plan in school. If they have any, um, you know, special education needs or school discipline problems. And we also look at the non-sex specific offenses. The JSOAP has been around for years. It's a favorite. We use it a lot. It has four main areas. So first is sexual preoccupation. And then it's behavioral problems, intervention, and community stability. And then the professor came out about three years ago uh, by James Worling up in Canada, who's done a lot of research. And this looks at sexual attitudes, historical sexual acts, psychosocial function, environment and family, and then treatment. And so when you say, what, what do I as an evaluator look at when I try to determine levels? Yeah, all that. Is the slide behind me? All that. <laughs> I look at all of that. And so uh, there's quite a lot that I do. So a uh, sexual behavioral risk assessment has a lot of components to it that we look through. So, um, and then if we create it, if we turn that into a psychosexual or a psychological evaluation with a sexual behavioral risk assessment, then I'm gonna give them about five to 10 different kinds of psychological tests, including an intelligence test and personality measures and behavioral measures and all that. So you can see that we're really looking at all aspects of the youth. I always prefer a psychosexual to an SBRA, but I also am a taxpayer and I understand where you're coming from, all right? But if there is a concern that there might be a risk factor that's not going to get picked up on on the SBRA because there's not psychological testing done with an SBRA. Do ask for that psychosexual. But I also understand you have a budget. You know, I'm very aware of that. So um, why we need collateral information. And so this is super important. We love when when the kids, go, when the victims go to the CJC, we love to see the reports on that as an evaluator. When the youth get interviewed by the police, we love to see that. So I won't do an evaluation without the police report. I just won't do it. Um, or at least a CJC interview, or at least some sort of victim statement that's third party. Um, we need information about the number of victims and the severity. That's very important to us as evaluators to know how to see this youth's risk level. And then we also, when we speak with the youth, determine their level of accountability. If the kid's coming in saying, I can't believe I did this, I'm so embarrassed, I really hurt my little sister or my little brother, I never want to do this again. I'm so glad I got caught. That's really different than, you know, it didn't hurt. He didn't even know what I was doing to him. So how did it hurt him? Why am I here? I'm the one getting punished. You know, it's like, well, yeah, you are. <laughs> so uh, I love to see CJC police reports, victim statements, court reports, anything third party that's official. Love it, love it, love it. Um, and the reason is, is because kids lie. So if I ask them if they have any other criminal offenses and they say, uh, no, 
then I look at their rap sheet and yeah, they have other criminal offenses. Or, you know, they say they only have one victim and I read the police report and there's three victims, you know. Kids do that, I expect them to. Unfortunately, sometimes parents lie. So I will ask the parents something to kind of get some collateral information and they're protective. They're mama bear or papa bear, this is their baby. They don't want their baby to, to be taken out of the home or have to go through treatment or have to pay for treatment. I mean, it comes out in several of the counties, it comes out of the parent's pocket. So that's, you know, that's expensive. So sometimes, and sometimes parents don't really wanna see that their child did what they've been accused of doing. They wanna minimize it. So I really, as an evaluator, need that collateral information. Let's talk about polygraphs. I know that was one of your questions. So there are two camps in Nojos, those who love polygraphs and those who think that they are um, either harmful to the youth or not appropriate to give to a youth or not helpful information. I'm just gonna be really transparent. I love polygraphs. I love polygraphs. And here's why, because I don't look at them as a, as a legal tool. I'm not looking at the polygraph information so that kid could be charged and all that. I am looking at the polygraph as one of the several pieces of information I have. It's one piece of the puzzle. And I want to know from looking at that polygraph, are, are we being accurate? You know, have you disclosed? So oftentimes in treatment, we'll start out with the youth filling out what's called a disclosure. So we say, hey, Johnny, look, we're going to have you do a disclosure. We'd like you to write out anyone you've had sexual contact with, whether it was consensual or not consensual, because sometimes Johnny doesn't understand that six-year-olds can't consent, you know, so anyone you've had sexual contact with, write it out, write it out. And so Johnny often will write who the victim noted in the police report, and that's it, that's it. We're like, okay, and that oftentimes is it. However, sometimes it's not. Sometimes there's other victims, but Johnny knows Nobody else knows about those other victims and Johnny already knows what happened to him for finding out about Susie. And so Johnny doesn't want to bring up Bobby and Billy and Cindy, you know. And so I have found that for the cases that don't seem just real obvious, like I see kids, they come in, they're petrified, they're young, they've offended on a cousin. And it's pretty, I'm guessing it's pretty clear that that's the extent. Now, I could be wrong because I'm not a human lie detector, but when I get a case where the kid's kind of not really seeming to be up front, I love a polygraph because I find it cuts out months of treatment. It just puts the treatment that much further ahead because the polygraph comes back as failed. And then I say, hey, Johnny, it doesn't seem like you're being up front. Look, you're already in therapy, you know? It's not gonna get worse. Just let's talk about what you've done so we could, first of all, help you not do it anymore. And second of all, reach out to the victims who might need therapy. Because if you have four victims, but you're only here for one, those other three victims don't have access to, uh, first of all, the parents even knowing they were victimized or resources that are made available for victims. So, um, and, we, and there's some great research out there on polygraphs. My favorite is Jamie Yoder. And she did an article in 2017. And so, and you could just read the results here. Um, they were five times more likely to be successful in completing treatment if they had an initial or a polygraph in the process of their treatment. So what we're seeing is it can be helpful to treatment. So as a treatment tool and moving the child along, I love polygraphs. But I'll let you have your own opinion whether or not it's harmful to the youth. There's a camp that says, oh, it's too scary for the youth to do. 15 year olds shouldn't be taking polygraphs. It's too scary. Well, my thoughts on that are, okay, on a scale of one to 10, how scary do you think it is? Oh, probably a seven. Okay, how scary do you think it is when mom walked in on him offending on his sister? Probably a 10. How scary do you think it is when he had to go to court and admit before, to a judge what he did? probably a 10. Okay, so we would have done those two things first. Help me understand how a polygraph is going to traumatize him. That's just my opinion. So, um, okay, minimum age. So Jared Rockwood, I love, he's our polygrapher that works down in Utah County. He's with Intermountain Polygraph and he works with John Pickup, who I also love. I think they're both really uh, good 
polygraphers. Um, this is straight from him. He says 12 years old or older, or at least the intellectual equivalent. So if we have a 13 year old who's intellectually disabled, not gonna do a polygraph. If we have a severely mentally ill youth, not gonna do a polygraph. If we have a low functioning youth with autism, not gonna do a polygraph, right? But if we have your run of the mill kid who's 12 or older, they are candidates for the polygraph examination, okay? Um, all right, I, this is where I sound really mean, and I know I sound really mean, please charge youth. Um, I have seen so many times that the police have, I know it's not your job, it, well, I mean, it kind of is your job, it is your job, but the police sometimes make a determination at the scene where they give the parent the choice. Can you imagine being that parent? So your son, your older son perpetrated on your younger son, and now the police officer is asking if you want the charge to go through. Like, Talk about divided loyalties, right? Who are you going to pick? It's like Sophie's choice. You're going to protect your younger son or you're going to protect your older son? What are you going to do? That is a question that should not be asked of parents. Um, so I always ask for what I like to see. What I really appreciate is one adjudication per victim. Because I know sometimes I'll see that a kid has one victim and there's 19 charges. Like that's cool because the kid offended 19 times. But to get the level of treatment he needs, one adjudication will do it for me. It really will. But when we see multiple victims, I like to see one for each victim. When we see one, vi one victim but multiple offenses, my preference is one for the first offense and one for the last offense. So we kind of give a time frame. The reason is, is because their rap sheet is a form of communication for me. I look at the dates on the case history summary or the rap sheet. I look at the dates of the offenses and how many offenses are charged. That leads me to score those tools that I just talked about, the J Surratt, the J Soap all that. So if the charges aren't there, their J Surratt scores way down. Even though they've had seven victims, they only got charged for one, they come out as low risk. And you're going like, wait a minute, they had seven victims. That's the way the tool's made. I also think it's a good communication tool for future reference. So oftentimes, not often, luckily not often, sometimes I will see a youth who has offended down the road. He had an initial offense, stopped offending, got some treatment, whatever, and offended down the road. Okay, I need to know that. I want to see an offense back then and now and say, this is not good. You know, I can see this history. I now know that it's a different risk level. I'm going to keep moving quickly. Felony versus misdemeanor, basically, it doesn't really matter on the risk tools other than on one question. Um, and so that's your call, right? That, that's your job. So I'm, I'm okay either way, whatever you want to do. Uh, why charge youth? It creates a record. We talked about this. Um, and I'm going to bring this up. It might be the magic bullet. Now, um, they, did, uh, the, they did a study, Micio Fonseca, Micio Fonseca, I'm not speaking Italian well, did this meta-analysis. And they found essentially that when a youth is charged, there's, they're less likely to offend again. And so, gosh, guys, <laughs> you might have the magic bullet, you know, to prevent future offenses. In fact, my husband, the other Dr. Tyler, Mr. Dr. Tyler Money, um, his hypothesis is the act of arrest and or adjudication itself may reduce recidivism more than any other single intervention. So I just want to put that out there. Not everyone's going to agree with me, and, I, and I'm okay if not everyone agrees with me. Um, research does show, just by the way, treatment does work. So I don't want you to feel like, oh, just arrest them, and then we're good. Treatment does work, and they need that treatment, right? So, um, but what I want to tell you is if they're not charged, treatment is now optional. So mom comes storming in. I can't believe Johnny offended on little Susie and... But don't charge them. I promise I'll get them treatment. Mom goes to treatment. It's $100 a session. That's $400 a month. I don't have $4 a month. Johnny, just don't do it again. And there's the end of treatment. So if they're charged, treatment is not optional. It's mandatory. And that's good because treatment helps. Um, consider detention. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one. Um, I'm mean. I, I wear it. I own it. I'm mean. I think that's the biggest wake-up call for a kid, whether it's just a night in detention. And again, we're going to look at this based on age and functioning and mental illness and things like that, right? Like, I'm not just saying every kid, but I'm saying consider it because so many kids say to me, 
gosh, I knew it was wrong, but I didn't know it was illegal. And that detention is a wake up call for the youth to say, yeah, it's illegal. Yeah, when you sexually offend on kids, it's illegal. It also allows the family some scramble time, particularly if the victim is in the home. It allows the family a chance to, okay, what are we gonna do now? What's the game plan? Can we bring this kid back in the home with the victim in the home or do we need to find a kinship? It, it gives a little of that. So not everybody's gonna agree with me and that's okay, that's okay. This is just my opinion. Um, please remember that juvenile offenders are kids. Very rarely are they antisocial sociopaths or psychopaths. They're just, they're really not, the vast majority. In my 23, 24 years of doing this, I could probably count less than, about the same number of times I've recommended level eight, right? The vast majority of them are young, dumb kids who were exploring and went too far and they knew they were doing it was wrong, but they didn't know it was illegal. And, it, you know, it, it, they just didn't really understand the full ramifications of what they were doing. Some knew, but I still wouldn't call them sociopaths or psychopaths. You know, so there's just this varying degree. But remember, you're working with kids. Kids change. Kids are young. Kids make mistakes. Um, I just always like to keep that in mind. Um, they're just kids who make a very poor choice. I'm going to go through these next slides really quickly. <laughs> I clearly overprepared. Oh, and, and I do have one question. Oh, yes. Oh, go ahead. Do you want to do it now? Yeah, I do. Okay. Uh, is there a maximum age? We have a lot of kids who, by the time we know about the offense, are near the end of court jurisdiction. Can we still recommend no Joes for a 20 year old? <gasps> okay, thank you. Great question. Did every, I don't know if that was heard. So, can you still recommend court, juvenile court jurisdiction for a 20 year old? And here's my understanding. Now, you all are the attorneys, so you correct me and give me feedback. Um, my understanding in working with juvenile court is as long as the youth person, now adult, now 20 year old, did the offense before they turned 18, they are under juvenile court jurisdiction until they're turning 21. That's my understanding. So I have personally assessed probably 30 to 40 kids who were 18, 19, or 20, one who was married, several pulled off missions, several pulled out of college, you know, one pulled out of the Navy that did something when they were before age 18 and then that child came forward two or three or four or five years later and they're now being charged because there is no statute of limitations for sexual offense in the state of utah so what i've seen the juvenile court do is pull them back in have me do an assessment and i recommend treatment and they stay under juvenile court jurisdiction until they're 21. so it's like sweetie get your treatment done before you're 21. otherwise you could face the adult world and so we much prefer that because if the kid offended when he was 15 and he's now 20 and married and in the Navy, I don't know that putting him in a facility is going to really be the best thing if he's not continuing to offend. Now, having said that, I also worked on a case with Wally Bugden, who I very much admire. Uh, it was a boy who was now 24. He offended when he was 14, 15 ish. And then the girl came out nine, 10 years later. And because he was an adult, he had to be tried in adult court and he was given a mandated nine year prison sentence. This boy was low functioning. He couldn't even hold a driver's license. He was a special ed kid. He didn't graduate from high school until he was 21. So we're taking this 24 year old young man who only offended, I don't wanna minimize. I'm sure for the girl, it was not okay. Who offended on one victim. And it was reported nine years later because the they were step siblings and the mother of her divorced his father and then they reported the abuse. They knew about it nine years before, but they reported it nine years later at the divorce. So this boy who is intellectually disabled, can't even drive, special ed, is now gonna go to prison, mandated nine years. Wally Bugden and I were able to speak to the legislators and got the law changed, so woot woot. Not that I don't want offenders to be accountable for what they do, I just say, let the punishment fit the crime. So, yes. Follow question on that. So, suppose that scenario comes about where the kid's now 20 years old, offended when he was 17, say it's a no just level four or, or six. Are you, do, we, do we want to put a. Uh, yeah, we don't do that. So, when they come to me when they're 18, 19, 20, we don't do any kind of mixing 
with juveniles. So if they need a secure, I'm just going to recommend adult that it be, you know, go to the adult court. But, kind of treatment, kind of but what we'll recommend is treatment. And they can do that individually or in age appropriate because we really don't want to put an 18 year old in with a bunch of 40 year olds and we don't want to put a 20 year old in with a bunch of 14 year olds. So they're this little no man's land of offenders. Um, and so we really try to fit the treatment correctly. Um, to match what they need at that point in their life. And this is assuming they haven't continued to offend. Now, if they've continued to offend, they just need to be addressed in adult court. But if they haven't had any offenses as an adult, and it's four years later, three years later, we don't want to uproot them and put them in, you know, a, a residential type treatment. So did that answer the question? We hope whoever our online person was. Okay, so um, a lot of these kids are socially awkward, don't know how to relate to peers. They imitate things. They've been sexualized. They're sexually exploring or they're sexually reactive. Not every youth who acts out has been offended on, but some have, and they're acting that out. This does not excuse sexual offense, but it's really important to understand the difference between adult offenders and juveniles who sexually offend. The, the recidivism rate is lovely. Um, latest statistics are between three to nine percent of juveniles who offend will reoffend. So that's th those are good statistics. I'm happy with those statistics. Um, okay, I'm going to just summarize this because <laughs> my opinion is if there's a victim in the home, my preference is the youth not go back to the home. It gives the victim space to heal. It gives the message to both the victim and the youth. This is serious and it's not okay. It prevents any reoffense and it prevents any intimidation or bullying for telling. And it gives that, that juvenile motivation to get their treatment done. One program that asked me not to name them, but they're one of my favorite programs in Utah County, are doing some internal statistics. And they found when the juvenile who acted out on a family member in the home got removed from the home, their treatment time shortened significantly. Well, let's face it. You now have to live with grandma who doesn't have the internet and, you know, thinks that you need to weed the garden every Saturday instead of living at home, being around your friends. Are you going to get your assignment done this week? Yeah, you're going to get your assignment done this week. You know, you're, you're out of your family home. So I have lots of slides on it and I'm just going to go through them all because basically the bottom line is my opinion, but there will be those who disagree with me and that's okay. Um, I think kinship is great. Um, have a safety plan. Your probation officers should fully understand how to do a good safety plan. I always put a safety plan in my evaluations. Um, we did want to talk one minute about state code. Um, let me just make sure I didn't have. Okay, so we're trying to really match the youth to the to the right level state mandate so what do you do when state code says the youth can only be you know in state's custody for x amount of months according to the new uh you know the what we used to call the house bill 239 right the things i have in bold up here unless termination would interrupt a necessary treatment program so if we have a kid that we assume should finish treatment in six months we put him in a good treatment program and the kid sits there and does this make me they don't do their assignments, they miss half the therapy sessions, or they just, they're just not compliant, they refuse to talk, whatever it is, they're like, six months and I'm out of here. That program, that therapist, can write a letter to the court stating the reasons why the youth needs to remain longer and then the judge can uh, keep them longer in the program. So that is built into that house bill. And believe me, I've done it. Um, I do what's called a post-treatment evaluation. So these are youth who have completed treatment and I make the recommendation whether they're done or not and where they should go from there. And so a lot of times I have a treatment program who says, Johnny is just the biggest pain in our butt. He, he instigates, he gets in fights, he doesn't do anything for treatment. And, and you know, the case manager's pushing to get him out because the house bill said he can only be in the program this long. And this kid has regressed rather than made progress. I do a post-treatment and then I do an official evaluation saying this kid is at the same level of risk, sometimes higher, <laughs> you know, than before he started the program. I recommend 
more time. And that does hold weight in court. The juvenile court judges that I work with are, are very good about working with kids that just are digging in their heels. So I hope that answered that question. I hope that answered that question. And just remember, once the court says the youth is done with treatment, so once the court steps off, I don't care what promises that child or that parent has made you, they're done because it costs them money, it takes their time, it interferes with their life. Very, very, very few families, even families with good intentions, continue treatment when the probation officer says, okay, you only have three more months left, we're gonna go ahead and let the court back off. You're done. <laughs> Oftentimes, you're done. So just keep that in mind that, okay. I hope I have been, oh, last thing and then I promise I'm done. So, um, it is what's most important to understand when I push to keep the juvenile in the community, that is actually creating more safety to the community because the more we can help the juveniles reduce recidivism by using their protective factors in their community, the more we can return the youth to the community to be a part of that community, the more we're creating safety. I don't know if that logic is making sense to you, but the idea is, is if a, think of that example I gave where the youth was locked in his room looking at pornography 24 seven. Now think of that youth was on the soccer team and going to church and making friends and going to high school prom. Who would you rather have be your neighbor? right? The one that's practicing and practicing with a therapist by their side in the community, learning what they're doing versus the one that never put the rubber to the road until they got released from court. So I know that's a weird way to see it. I fully support level eight. I fully support level six. I fully support level five. I make recommendations for higher levels all the time, but we want least restrictive environment. Okay. That's it. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Money. Uh, I'm not a juvenile practitioner, but I found that really fascinating. So thank you. Okay, we are on break until four o'clock. Uh, so we'll see you back in a few minutes. <laughs>